In the previous video, we began discussing how to model turbulent flows in a CFD context. We discussed some of the characteristics of turbulent flows that make it so difficult to model. In particular, all turbulent flows are unsteady, three-dimensional, and involve very, very small temporal and spatial scales. And then we discussed the direct numerical simulation, or DNS, approach, which involves solving the Navier-Stokes equations, which contain all of the physics necessary in order to capture turbulence. In this video, I'm going to discuss the large eddy simulation approach, or LES. Let me also just say that for both DNS and LES, I'd very much encourage you to go online, look at YouTube videos that show animations of DNS and LES simulations, and you'll see some rather beautiful fluid dynamics, as well as you'll get a good sense for how powerful these tools are, how much detail you can get out of a DNS and or an LES simulation. So LES. LES involves filtering the velocity and the pressure fields in order to separate the large scales and the small scales, so the large eddies and the small eddies that are inherent in a turbulent flow. So the way we do that is that we locally average the complete fields. So we take the velocities, for example, do the same thing for pressure, and then we have a filter kernel, call it G here, and that filter kernel has an associated length scale cap delta it's the filter size, and that's gonna determine the threshold between the large eddies and the small eddies. So any eddy that's greater than, bigger than capital delta, we'll call that a large eddy, and that will be computed. So that's why it's called LES, large eddy simulation. We're simulating the large eddies. Any eddies that are smaller than that filter size, capital delta, we'll consider them to be small turbulent eddies, and those are gonna be modeled using a subgrid scale model. So we have this cutoff between the small scales and the large scales. Large scales are simulated, small scales are modeled. So how does this help us relative to DNS? Well, if you remember DNS, we had this Kolmogorov scale, L sub cap K. That was the size of the smallest eddies that appear in a turbulent flow. So if we're doing DNS, we need to be able to resolve those small scales. So if you have a tiny little eddy at those small scales, you have to have 10, 20, 50, 100, whatever number of grid points across that L sub K in order to sufficiently resolve that small eddy. Now what we're saying is this filter size, capital delta, everything larger than that will be computed, but everything smaller will be modeled. So now, in terms of setting the resolution of the simulation, it's now this delta that we have to be able to sufficiently resolve. So the grid sizes, the delta x, delta y, and delta z, now need to be smaller than delta rather than being smaller than the Kolmogorov scale. And that's gonna buy us a lot of extra resolution. So we'll be able to reduce the number of good points in order to get the same overall resolution and therefore speed up the calculations. So here's how we separate those scales. So we take our Navier-Stokes equations, which we've seen before, same equations as we use in DNS, and we're gonna separate out the large scale and the small scale features. The large scale, both pressure and velocity, will be U bar and P bar, and then the small scales, both U and P, will be denoted by the primes. I've emphasized here that the U bar and P bar are both functions of time, so they're unsteady, evolving flows. For RANDs, we're gonna use a very similar looking decomposition of these velocities but in fact will be quite different for reasons I'll emphasize at the time. So the U bars, those are the resolvable scale velocities. Those are the ones that are being computed by the large eddy simulation. Whereas the U prime, that's the subgrid scale or the SGS velocity and pressure, and that is being modeled. So again, simulated, modeled, simulated, modeled. Large scales being simulated, small scales being modeled. So let's write down the filtered Navier-Stokes equations. Now I'm gonna do something I never do when I'm teaching, and that is to use tensor notation or Einstein notation. I like to write all the PDEs out, all the derivatives out, and not use this index notation, because most students find it very confusing and not very helpful in identifying physics and so on. But I have succumbed here to doing it in order for brevity. The reason why I'm doing this is because I don't want us to get bogged down in the details of these equations, the individual terms, I want us to focus on the big picture and the new features that are included because of this filtering process. So here's the continuity equation and then the momentum equation. And you'll see it looks very similar to the usual Navier-Stokes equations, 
except for these convection terms now look quite different. So that ui uj bar is now these four terms. You'll notice the first term is in terms of the resolvable scales, the scales that are computed by the large eddy simulation. Whereas these three terms all have primes in them and those are being modeled. So this will be simulated and these would be modeled. And so we need to figure out how we're gonna model those terms. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So those extra terms are called the SGS Reynolds stress. So the subgrid scale Reynolds stress. So next we need to think about how are we gonna connect these two? We need a model that accounts for what's going on in the large scale and how the energy is feeding down to those smaller scales. So that's what we're gonna look at here, that's the SGS. The earliest and most common SGS approach is known as the Smagorinsky model. Smagorinsky was actually interested in doing simulations of the atmosphere. And he came up with this idea of the large eddy simulation, which was really groundbreaking at the time. So the Smagorinsky model, it is an eddy viscosity model. So what that means is the fluid itself has a viscosity. It's a property of the fluid itself. But when you have these small scale turbulent eddies, you have an effective increase typically in viscosity. So the turbulence makes it seem more viscous. So you have this eddy viscosity model, and there are RANS models we'll talk about in the next video that are also eddy viscosity based models. Okay, so here's the basic approach. So we have our SGS Reynolds stress, the tau ij, which is those terms with the primes in them, and that's going to be equal to this expression here. Again, I don't wanna get into the details, just the overall approach but it involves the tau kk, delta ij, and this mu sub t, and then this sij bar. The sij bar, that's the strain rate for the resolved field. So it looks like this. It's the strain rate tensor, but from the resolved field, the field that's been calculated. And then the eddy viscosity, the mu sub t, is going to be c sub s, that's the Smagorinsky coefficient squared, times the density rho, times the filter size cap delta squared, times the absolute value of the S bar. Here I've shown what that is. That's the square root of the product of Sij bar with Sij bar. So in the Smagorinsky approach, this C sub S, the Smagorinsky coefficient, is just a constant. It's just a number. And it's a number that we'd have to get from actual flows, whether from DNS or experimental flows, and estimate the value of Cs for the particular types or classes of flows that we're interested in. Let me make some additional remarks about this overall approach and how we can improve on the Smagorinsky model. So in the Smagorinsky model, we only account for energy transfer from the large to the small scales. So what that means is as follows. We have those eddies, scales that are larger than cap delta. We have those that are smaller than cap delta. These are being simulated. These are being modeled. Okay, so that's always the case in LES. Now for the Smagorinsky model, what we're allowing for is energy from the large scales to transfer to the small scales. So the large scale motions in the flow as a whole can cascade down and influence the small scales but it does not allow for information transfer back from the small scales to the large scales. This is what we call backscatter. So backscatter is that information energy going from the small scales back to the large scales. Now in some flows, that's not a terrible simplification. There isn't much backscatter in certain flows, but in other flows there is, as we'll discuss. So where we have the most problem with the Smagorinsky approach is when we have flows near solid boundaries because the eddy viscosity is much smaller there and the flow is more anisotropic, meaning it behaves differently in different directions, and that's because of the presence of a solid surface. It's in those situations near solid surfaces typically where the Smagorinsky model doesn't work as well. So the way to improve on that is to use what's called a dynamic SGS model. Smagorinsky is not dynamic because C sub S is a constant. If we make C sub S a function of space and time, so it's an additional variable that we'd be solving for, then it's dynamic, it's changing, and that would allow us to improve on both of these points. So it would allow for the backscatter, 
that it can occur in certain flows, and it would allow for the anisotropy that can occur near boundaries. The idea is that we will allow for C sub s to evolve in both space and time. It's now a variable rather than a constant, and it would be computed based on the resolvable flow field. So the large eddy simulation, the LES simulation, the resolvable scales, that information would then be fed into the CS function. And then that automatically adjusts the SGS parameter for the anisotropy and the flow near walls and, and so forth. And it does allow for backscatter, where you could actually have a negative effective viscosity because of that backscatter by accounting for energy transfer from the small scales to the large scales. There's a number of different ways to get these dynamic SGS models. Many different methods have been put forward over the years. There are methods that are motivated from empirical or experimental results. There are methods that are motivated from analytical results, such as variational methods. Even now, people are using neural networks and so forth to develop these dynamic SGS models. So now the whole purpose of this, again, is that LES is far more economical computationally than DNS because we're modeling and not having to solve all those small little turbulent eddies. That allows us to do much more complicated flows with sufficient resolution on the computers that we have today. As with DNS, as computers get bigger and faster, we'll be able to do bigger, more complex problems even faster. So because of that, when you see LES simulations, you will find them for more complex flows than is possible using DNS, and you'll see them at also at much higher Reynolds numbers than is possible using DNS. Now where it's similar to DNS is in the fact that LES solutions are unsteady. It is capturing the unsteady behavior of the flow. You get a lot of detail out of the simulations, so you get quantitative and qualitative effects, but I just want to make it clear it is not suitable for developing turbulence models because LES itself is a turbulence model. That was one of the uses I mentioned for DNS. It can be used to develop turbulence models. LES, although the results look very similar and have similar looking levels of detail, it's already modeling the turbulence in some sense, so it's not suitable for developing turbulence models for, say, RANS that we'll discuss in the next video.